to Hey folks, Rob Potter here of The Promise Revealed. I have two esteemed guests with me here today. Of course, the famous Dr. Raymond Keller. Uh, we just, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Las Vegas, came out for a little fun time. We went to uh, the Lake Mead uh, location of Victor One Valley Thorship. If it was there, we don't know. It often travels. And um, Raymond, of course, is my dear friend and um, the contactee of the Venusians. And of course, uh, for those of you who follow me, this is probably my maybe third interview or fourth with uh, David nice. Wallace. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the Victory of Light radio show and the and the effort we're doing here. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Okay, so I thought I would uh, start off real quick here by sharing with you guys um, uh, my website because both these guys are going to be at my Mount Shasta Summer Conference. So... This is the Mount Shemmer Conference and the homepage, the first banner that comes up is you just click this button here. And it's gonna take us to the page where you're gonna be able to read the biographies of everyone. And uh, of course, Raymond Keller, if you know anything about me, needs no introduction. This year's conference is dedicated to him and uh, our Venusian brothers. The Look to Venus Morning Star Revelations was an information or a suggestion by uh, her ladyship, the Queen of Venus, uh, Lady Orda. So here we have tickets available right here. Um, and we also have the introduction to the conference and all this information, if you look at it here, and I really recommend all everyone reads everything on this page. If you wanna become a vendor, we have a few places available, all the prices. What a really cool things here for people like, oh, no, where do I stay? Where do I stay? Looky there, folks. We've got a free campground. We've got another free campground, another free campground to start you off. Um, there's a paid one, a hookup, RV hookups, all that. you got the KOA. you got a, a kind of nice hot springs. It's about, that's about 25 minutes from the venue. Um, that's a really great place. They have uh, hot tubs, natural uh, water from the ground, bed and breakfast, more campgrounds, vacation rentals, and these actually go to the uh, the uh, city um, chamber of commerce uh, sites there, and weed as well. Airports, all your information is here, and you come down here and you see the wonderful speakers, Laura Eisenhower, uh, Brad Olson, Alex Collier, Apollo, a bright young uh, star, of course, Suzanne Ross, who has a Sci Spy TV, and I just got back from a successful uh, solstice celebration there in Sedona, Arizona, along with uh, Brad Olson, Michael Jaco, Celestine Starr, and uh, quite a few other great luminaries. Uh, Dennis Adams, uh, a woman who talks to dead people. I, she actually bought in Fred Bell, my mother and my father, who passed over, and she gave me. Uh, you know, the things that only I would know, um, that no one would know. She didn't even know what she's telling me. So it was confirming a little, um, more private part of our conversation was valid. Frank Chile, an old friend of mine. And of course, this wonderful astrologer, Jane, she's going to be doing a workshop. Amazing, amazing astrologer. Lola Johnson, who was privileged to go into the inner earth. Vivian Chavez, Arcturian. Jamie Lou last night had an amazing, uh, she does her sound healing pretty cool right? oh oh yeah it was awesome really amazing and, and the, the the composite bolts that uh, with the, the unique vibrations and, and the tones it was perfect then we have our tourist Rob. he's a uh, he's a unique uh, he's an extraterrestrial friend of sarah adams going to be there and there's david right there and we have uh savannah slauson and Isaac Mars, some young kids, and of course, Neil Gaier, opponent to Ascension. I just did a Pyramid Knowledge Conference. Brooks Agnew of the Inner Earth, and then we have Lori Spagna. She's uh, really a, a wonderful, vivacious, she reminds me of Scott Warner, a positive light worker. And of course, Maureen St. Germain, who's written several books on the fifth dimension. There's Scott Warner, uh, Dr. Scott Warner, who took away his doctor because he was healing people, um, literally <laughs> threatened his life. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, Becca B., a new friend of me, just had dinner with her last night. And one of the master of ceremonies here, Dadamire, of course, Ben Chasteen of Edge of Wonder. 
and uh, we have John Polk. We're doing some sky watches. We have sacred geometry with Sam, and we've got a, a couple other workshop people coming. So again, you can purchase your tickets here. Um, you know, all my speakers get some tickets. So actually, if you want to support Dave, if you like what he's you hear here, and you want to support him to come, uh, David, why don't you give them um, a way to contact you? I think uh, it's called her most their email. Hermosa Fields, like strawberry fields, only Hermosa Fields, H E R M O S A F I E L D S at gmail.com. And you can send me an email and then I'll send you information and uh, then we'll take it from there. Any, any support for ticket sales would be terrific. We uh, still have some people up in the Palos Verdes Peninsula that are making a decision about their large ticket purchase. And uh, we'll be finding out from them shortly. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no worries. So, um, um, yeah, if you want to support there, uh, each of my speakers get three tickets. The tickets right now are 350 um, you know, when you contact Dave, he may offer a slight discount to encourage you to buy. And all my speakers have that as well. So um, uh, on my website, you can learn about it here, but go there. Okay, that's, a, that's a, uh, enough of the infomercial for that part. Now I'm going to take you to the next infomercial. And of course, uh, we have a, the great, uh, we have a seven a book sale with Dr. Raymond Andrew Keller. Uh, you get a special price there. And this is his uh, it's actually an eight, it's going to be a nine part series really, but on Venus this is uh, the famous Venus Rising amazing book, rockets to Venus, discounting everything, Raymond's time travel adventure, and of course he covers all the the government mis uh, information that's going on for years. And this book was written by a woman born on the Earth in 1902, and there's a picture of her recently. She is ascended in what's called a form of translation like Annalise Karen and many others. And then of course, the, the flying saucer legacy. Raymond has incredible annotations and there's him wearing his little shirt with the Venusian Metron time travel symbol on the cover um, from the, this book here. Um, and of course we have uh, the most recent book uh, from uh, Raymond Keller called Flying Saucers from Venus They Come. Uh, and here's my little pathetic effort so far, but we have Venus uh, Omnic Omnic, the woman who came from the fifth dimension, some great stuff. And this here is really incredible. This is Dr. Raymond Keller's written uh, limited edition of the Gospel of Thomas. And we might talk about that a little bit today. Strangers of the Pentagon, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to take you now. Uh, we're going to stop sharing and uh, uh, Let's uh, talk a little bit about David. David's information, I'll just give you a background and then we'll, we'll take off and then uh, we'll, we'll let a dialogue go here. Uh, basically what happens in 2017, uh, David was taken um, uh, in an experience from uh, his home planet originally, it was called Brokali in the Aldebaran system. And he had an amazing experience there. He became a, uh, He's an ambassador uh, for them on Earth. And at the same time, he was providing evidence of the situation on Earth. And he gave a, a, a presentation, which is quite amazing. We spoke about this. If you look at my YouTube channel, you're going to see this amazing story. And we have more to go here. We're going to get into maybe uh, some other stuff here. But uh, David um, learned many, many things. And he didn't, couldn't do algebra and calculus. Uh, in 2017, folks, but he just graduated 96% in a master's in physics from Princeton, and he's getting calls from uh, some of the dark, darker technology companies that want to use his brain to pry open some of the secrets of the universe that he's had. So welcome, David, and uh, where would you guys like to talk about today? Well, um, thank you for the lovely introduction, Rob. Um, it wasn't Princeton, but it was not too far off from Princeton. And I'd actually, I know I, uh, I, I did prefer, a I'd prefer not to mention the university because That's they've okay. just offered me uh, uh, some doctoral work towards my PhD because they know I've applied for um, 
two scholarships, one to UC Davis at Berkeley and one to Cambridge University in England to go work with Dr. Professor Sir Richard Friend, who is the head of uh, physics and higher mathematics at Cambridge. Um, but at this point, I'm glad you got the university name wrong because uh, since our first couple of interviews, I've really had some very strange uh, people reaching out to me with their own agenda. And this has nothing to do with my education. It's just whatever they felt they needed to express to me. And not all of it's been positive. So if we can skip mentioning my university just for now. And I, then, I, I, I said the wrong one on purpose. But, you know, I had a feeling you did. But, you know, it's funny because I have some friends at Princeton that teach and they're going to go, hey, Dave, you know, <laughs> no. But so so um, activation and there's a there's a lot of triggers that, that we carry in our minds. And I like to think that they're almost genetically or DNA encoded triggers. They're electrochemical in nature. And right now, the recordings that I've been sharing with you and Raymond um, about cognition and uh, uh, polymetry, which is the science of higher cognition and being able to recognize uh, higher geometry and higher three-dimensional shapes in everyday things, such as symbols, letters, or numbers, and how physics actually uh, has a higher geometry expression even though human beings right now are stuck on communicating things in a, in a linear two-dimensional fashion. When humans write, um, it's almost a, a, a given that we will always write in a two-dimensional linear fashion with a pen on a piece of paper. Doesn't matter if you're Japanese or Chinese in the direction on the paper that you write, whether it's up and down, forward or backwards, whatever the culture that is communicating with the written word, we have it ingrained into our minds that the only way to write these higher expressions down is in a linearized format, in a two-dimensional format. And why? Well, that's obvious. We're, we're three-dimensional beings existing in a three-dimensional space. And one of the activations that I received since being taken away to Broccoli was that it was time to start re releasing information about the science called polymetry. And polymetry is both recognition of higher dimensional shapes, but understanding how we're very, very close to creating gateways so that we can have a physical transference where we can walk from the third into the fourth or fifth dimension, but not go any further because then you would have to remove your spirit to go any higher. And when I talk about higher geometry and how all higher physics eventually turns into a higher form of geometry, I'd like people to think about the dimensionality of letters and numbers because we are trained to write in a thin linear line our expression of thought or mathematics. What about using your mind's eye to visualize that letter or that number as a three-dimensional item and just sort of rotate it in front of you for a moment? If you can start to train your mind to understand the extra dimensionality of single simple things like letters and numbers, then when you practice this for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, the next time you look at a crop circle, you will be flooded with electrochemical emotions and uh, the understanding of the hierarchical system of communications from Gaia and also from above. Because I think crop, I think crop circles work in that, that way. There's a dipole spiritual evolution that occurs where the planet communicates to us by releasing light spheres and our friends from above will come down and work with Gaia and guide those lights into new forms of higher geometry messages that will wake up a genetic memory within us. I wanted to, um, I'm going to have Raymond comment on that. Can I bring, can I just show your, your book that you gave me a little bit? The, sure. of the, of the three stuff. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Todd, would you like to comment on that sure, sure. dissertation? Sure, I would like to do that. Um, yes, one of the things that we can do uh, in the third dimension to help us to uh, look at um, uh, extra dimensionality uh, in the context of numbers would be to take some systems like Tesla's uh, 369 or the Fibonacci sequence, uh, uh, the grand spiral expanding, expanding right. rather than linear, 
and uh, also the um, uh, let's see, we had the the uh, oh the nineteen point five degrees uh, latitude when you look at the different planets, especially Mars and the Cydonia region, and then compare that with nineteen point five degrees latitude on Jupiter, where you have the red spot, and then Correct. on the Earth, it's the Hawaiian Islands. Isn't that interesting? You know, it's it's a great parallel right there. I also wanted to mention the golden mean. Oh, yes, yes. So all of this is, I mean, this is really magical stuff. Numbers are quite quite magical and and revelatory, and they do give us uh, insight into thinking outside the box. Right. So I want to share this book that David gave me. It's a short part of his uh, PowerPoint. And um, there will be no images or cameras allowed during during his talk. Um, he has a lot of very advanced stuff that some people might want to get. Uh, he it's it's in his head. It's not uh, physically created yet. There's a from the realization to another one, but um, we don't want to get too much into the math here, folks. But uh, he got ninety six percent, and the four percent he got wrong is probably Earth based physics. Uh, misunderstandings is what I'm going to guess. But this is the, go ahead and say that, linear. Uh, that's linear photaic physics nomenclature. So what we have here, folks, I'm just going to take you real briefly through some stuff here. And um, and uh, this isn't going to give anybody anything really, but this is about uh, the actual mapping of uh, outer space, which is already done by the galactics. Uh, Dave, why don't you share, um, uh, let me go here first. So th they have uh, a three-dimensional thing, kind of like a hieroglyph. And, Correct. And what he has done, folks, is he's taken three different uh, slideshows, uh, and he has, uh, on three different slides, drawn something. And when you light it from the back, it projects a 3D image. Now... The being, you can't really see it here. You'll see it at the thing. There's a, a, a ship from a being named L uh, came into his living room. And I'm going to share with you the picture of him here. He's from Andromeda. Is that the, that's a constellation, correct? Correct. Okay, so there's L. Well, Andromeda is a is a galaxy. Oh, and it's a constellation. So he's from it the has, galaxy. It has connecting constellations which guide us towards it. So he's, remember the constellations are like beacons because they're the they're the brightest stars that um, represent the location of specific galaxies. So not all constellations have planetary bodies, but many of them are uh, uh, actual, just very bright suns. Right. So is is this are they from the M three galaxy or from the yes yes uh, L is uh, M three. That's who Fred was working with as well. So we have here, um, um, can I show him the crystal? Sure. Okay, so what happened was, is he, Dave is having a little bit of a problem with his midterm exams. And Al, this is levitating crystal in the room with David. And he didn't really have to talk to him. He just basically projected these images onto the wall. And David had a, a, a deep understanding. And It was uh, interesting. It was interesting because what a lot of people miss when they see that, okay, that's a, a photaic linear nomenclature projector. They gave me the download for construction of the projector so that I can help people visualize the higher order of geometry of all known physics. So um, anyway, so I, I wanted to share with you, uh, these little beings are a little different. They're from the Aldebaran system from a planet called Brokali. And, um, there's a little being uh, that, that wakes him up <laughs> and there, and there he is kind of peeking over his uh, bakery, came into his bakery shop in Hermosa. If you want some great pies, there it is. And then he's uh, very sweet. He's a dear little fellow. And then, uh, and they, they, they show up at his house all the time. I'm going to show another image here. And then we have the, um, we won't get into explaining that, I don't think. But I well, just... that's a that's a that's a photograph of on on board the Palameter. That's a alien technology right there. That's a spectroscopy and, point. You know, it's funny. I don't like using the term alien because you know it's so oftentimes knocked about for the wrong reasons on Earth. 
I've met lots of extraterrestrials. I've yet to meet an alien. I should say it that way. There you go. So this is a picture that David took on board the craft of Kim Jim. Can you explain why it's in that position? Why it's in that? Kim Jim is in a manifestation pit position. You know, he comes from the fifth dimension and he manifests physically. And what you're seeing is his neuronal uh, structure and his higher vibrations. And it's the form of, there he is, this is sitting, sitting in the background yeah. and you he has a little arm and his black tunic and his head, and he's sitting at the control panel. And that was the ship that I went on before our lunch or breakfast with Nathan. Right. So, so here's uh, um, his head. Here's his, his his feet, and these are these are the crystals right. that are kind of like the superimposition spectrometry. Uh, and these are how big are these crystals on board the ship they were quite large they were you know 20 to 23 feet high and they weigh anywhere between um 120 to 200 tons each and and finally i'm going to show you that you know from a guy who didn't know geometry and algebra the downloads from this group is uh, for his mission is to help humanity when we're ready to develop um um this technology uh so, so what I've done is I've used the Laplace transform and the Laplacian is a measurement tool and it has both an orthogonal and a derivative expression, but it, the Laplace transform is used for measuring derivatives, uh, measuring uh, special equations within a, a given space. And the Laplacian is just a fascinating, fascinating engineering tool that they teach us in physics but it's something that's been overlooked. And I'm going to go back after I write the scientific textbook about polymetry. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about extra dimensional versions of the Laplace transform because the Laplacian can be used to mirror itself all the way up to six different dimensions. And then you can actually begin to measure things from the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimension with the Laplacian. And the Laplace is a gift that was given to mankind. I can't remember the name of the doctor that developed it but uh, it's a fabulous measurement tool. So I use that to help coordinate uh, direction while we're going through deep stellar space. One of the things that I wanted to mention, and I know that we talked about polymetry publicly before, is, and I'm not gonna mention any names, but some people in the UFO community that have their own shows will watch something we're talking about, and then they'll briefly mention it on another show. And I'd really like people to not repeat what we're talking about because they just don't have the whole picture. And I'm gonna be releasing photographs of higher mathematics of stellar cartography, this is new, and how a polymetry system works and how the crystal system works and, and everything. I'm gonna explain the whole thing because this is what I was shown when I was taken on board and allowed to take photographs. So, so folks, this stuff, so I'm just giving you a little bit of taste here. You know, a lot of the math for us, we probably not often go to sleep where we would have. I'm going to keep it really simple. No, I know, I know, but I mean, for for the physics, they'd be on the edge of their seats. But I wanted to um, uh, uh, talk to Raymond. I showed Raymond one of those things, and uh, he goes, "Well, that looks like a a super imposition of particles, kind of like the Venusian uh, craft that uh, go there." And of course. Raymond actually in his books are amazingly annotated. Go ahead and show that image again if you want, just briefly. Yeah. Um, and Raymond is absolutely correct. And so what, what Raymond, so Raymond, why don't you talk about what um what you had learned from I, I think Alon had spoken to you about these uh this these particular images, Raymond. Oh oh yes. Yes, these were these were fundamental to um, um let me show creating a bilocation signal. Correct. Correct. So, so basically, um, so how, how do the Venusians and their technology, it's, they're utilizing certain uh, similar uh, beyond time and space? Yes, because they, they were once, as, as we are, technologically and spiritually developing or in the process of uh, developing. And um, they are working with certain select individuals and uh, scientists uh, around the world, and uh, as are other extraterrestrial groups, and uh, 
I, I won't say any more than that, other than the fact that uh, George Adamski and uh, Howard Menger and others have, that have come before before me have, have, have also said as much. Now in my current book, uh, Flying Saucers from Venus They Come, uh, there's a 20 part chapter all about the development of uh, anti-gravitation technology in the Wonderful. beginning in the late 1940s, all the way through the 1950s. So I went through all my, my UFO files in, in, the, um, in my uh, temperature controlled uh, uh, garage uh, storage area in West Virginia. I, so I had articles from Science and Mechanics, uh, the Gravity Research Foundation, uh, award-winning articles uh, beginning in 1949. Uh, all the way through and to the corporations, uh, various corporations like the Lear Corporation mm -hmm. and uh, 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 Boeing Hughes Aircraft. And I put all of these, uh, all these together in a chronological order and started to look for, for, for patterns. And I found, you know, various government contracts with the uh, helicopter companies, aviation companies, um, electronics companies, and various projects that they were working on that anti-gravity research that they were funded by the US government. So they, they, uh, they distribute that information out to different contractors in order to hide what they're doing, but it's like playing connect the dots, isn't it? You've done such a fabulous job with that, Raymond. Oh, thank, thank you. Well, I was so happy to find the, to find the connections and even the test pilots that flew the G ships and um, the- oh my. The amazing, uh, the amazing rocket uh, that they had, uh, propulsion system, like a um, a kind of a pre ion drive type thing, that they launched a, a probe ship to uh, to Venus in 1948, and all that stuff is in the in the latest book, Flying Saucers from from Venus. They come. You won't believe it. Everything. Is is just thoroughly documented where it came from, the newspaper, the date, uh, the. No, it's a it's a seminal work. Rob has shared a few excerpts of the book with me, and I plan on picking up a copy when I come out to Shasta. It's the one book. I mean, all of your work's amazing. It's the one book I really want to get into because you're bang on, and I'd just like to mention that. And Rob has has exhibited this ability as well, which has been surprising. There's two types of cognition in, in putting together or correlating facts. And when we correlate things, we're um, using our parietal lobes and we're using um, our central midbrain to send that information out. In the, in the art of correlating, which our mind will do for us if you have a healthy mind, you end up developing what I call a visceral cognition of higher mathematics. It's almost like you don't necessarily have to understand all the nuts and bolts, but you feel that you have an understanding about it. This is something that, that modern science and modern academia refuses to recognize. Unless you can watch your teacher talk about the nuts and bolts and then you yourself transcribe it at exactly how your teacher has taught you, they don't wanna know. But you're absolutely correct is that you have this amazing visceral cognition of higher mathematics. And the fact that you were able to nail that diagram of mine in the book, I'm not surprised. I can't wait to read that book. So yeah, when you showed me that stuff, see, um, Dr. Fred Bell wrote a book called Inside Track, basically going into the evolution of physics and all the, the theories that were bought out. And so he was a teacher that the Pleiadians, actually in his book, I'll show you the mathematical formula that proves time travel is, exists, of sure. course, faster than speed of light. And Raymond Keller, of course, is living proof of that. But um, I, when I saw that, I could kind of grasp from what you had told me what was going on. And like, again, I don't know the math, but from, from those images and understanding lasers and, and all that stuff, that are, are the nuts and bolts I was able to ask intelligent questions. I know you were surprised that I, 
I, I know that because again, I probably can't do algebra or, or calculus either. Um, well, you know, I was a I was a total math dunce when I was young. I had I you know in the sixth grade I started developing migraines when they put fractions in front of me, and like you know my mom was that hippie artist animal activist, and she just said you know you only need mathematics to balance your checkbook, and you said you know and and navigate stellar the stars, but. Um, so what they did to my mind was to clear away brain damage that I had received emotionally at some point in my life or from past lives. They just cleared it away. It was like blowing lint through a tube. They got rid of the garbage out of my head and they realigned my neural network so that I would have cognitive flow with ease. So when we absorb information through our eyes or through our ears, uh, I was able to correlate everything that they trained me at a very rapid succession after they had flashed everything in my eyes, all of that information was able to go to the different regions of my brain naturally by my brain. And then that's activated later or it touches upon genetic triggers or things that we inherently know as a, as a species and releases that information in little puffs until we're emotionally prepared and intellectually prepared for the big picture. And so I'm still in the process of getting closer to the big picture but I'm starting to now be able to digest larger amounts of information as it opens up. And I'm, I'm starting to write a, a treatise right now about developing a dialogue with our minds so that we can actually teach ourselves how to do this without extraterrestrial intervention. And these are just part of the many gifts that they gave me. Yeah, I'd like to share, um, uh, David has been able to um, arrange meetings for certain people of, and, and visitations. Uh, this is when he just um, uh, shared with someone in New Jersey, and uh, I just did a pyramid. Uh, uh, or North Carolina. Oh, North and, Carolina. Yeah. So, so here. Right. This is from my friend Laura in North Carolina. Um, she changed. She took some photographs, and then when she um, adjusted the filter level after looking at the photos, this appeared. And this is a trans-dimensional ship, which you see in front. But you all, because of the amount of energy that this ship is putting off from leaving where it's going, from the, this is a such a great example of the vapor barrier that that exists. It's like a clear gelatine barrier between our dimension and the next. It's what it's what spirits can pass through in order to materialize when you see a ghost. Well, you can see the ship and the pyramid behind it. And there's actually a light coming off the top of the pyramid. This is all in the sky above my friend Laura's house. Now, Laura is um, uh, becoming a contactee. She was fascinated by uh, ufology and, and, and understanding the existence of extraterrestrial species. You know, we're, we're at a point now where we don't need to convince each, each other or anybody else that they exist because they do. And so it's really just developing communication levels with them. And so this ship showed up and this is uh, not her first sighting. She's had five or six very positive sightings, but Kim Jim, who went to go see my friend Baz in Greece, then went to go see Laura. And it's nice because it's that extra special confirmation that you get when they show you photographs of Kim Jim's ship and say, oh my God, he showed up at 8.30 to nine o'clock in the North Northwest hemisphere and he was there. And it's such a wonderful thing. I'm trying to work right now on a conversation with L and let, let the conversation be recorded. I've also asked L to come down. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see. We might not want to mention too much about that right here. Yeah, this is going to be interesting. I know that there's some dark entities that would like to hire me to work on telemetry systems for radio, uh, for um, missiles to be fired in outer space at other planets. And, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna work with NASA. I'm not gonna work with Elon Musk and I'm not gonna work with any of them because they just don't have a soul. Right. And, and it was awful, you know, in our last year of graduate studies at school, members of aerospace in specializing in weapons programs would actually come into our classroom and try and poach us, you know, because of our aptitude. Oh, you're really good with, you know, photics and, and, and linear light studies and, and photon dispersion. And gee, we sure like you to design a, a photag laser, you know, a telemetry system so we could shoot ICBMs at other planets. 
and it's like so shocking and so sad but you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how many kids sign up because the money's unreal and this is where you go okay I'm going to make that's how they do it with politicians and everything. I'm not going to take $300,000 a year to to develop a weapon that's going to murder millions of people. It's just the whole thing makes you want to throw up. I know. But this is what they're doing with the university system is they're using them to poach all the top people for ultra weapons programs. Absolutely. Raymond, why don't you talk a little bit and um, uh, about the um, uh, interdimensionality of um, the ships and, and some of the stuff. Oh, sure, and sure. The, can you put that last photograph back up put there? Put it back because up, okay. That's a good example. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what you see is that, that the extraterrestrial ships have a certain density just uh, just like we do, but perhaps a little bit a, a little bit lighter. But what happens is when, they, uh, when the, the plasma field materializes in our plane of existence in the atmosphere, what it does is it sparks all the molecules of the uh, uh, in, in the atmosphere surrounding the ship. The the plasma field just sparks it off, and so it it has that that phantom kind of glow. So when a lot of people see the UFOs and they see uh, uh, lights in the sky uh, and so forth, uh, it's not um, it's not swamp gas. It's a real physical object. But it just takes on that appearance because of the ionization effect, and and cause of from um, you know when when you think about the extraterrestrials and giving this information, obviously uh, David has told me that, or Kim Jim actually told me, he said that they've been working with the Venusian councils and any disagreements on how to deal with this stuff is down. So it seems like it's coming. The, the technology David's laying the groundwork for, um, you know, putting it together in your mind and in theory is one thing, but the actual hardware, this is going to take a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, brilliant, dedicated experts in their field to put together uh, the engineering of the actual physical aspect of this. And I'm sure David will be guided through this process um, if we can get there. What is the Venusians... Um, um, I mean, they're feeling that we have to, to reach a certain level before we can really get this. The bad guys have certain aspects of this well, technology. They're, but... they're worried about our technological uh, development surpassing our spiritual maturity to catch up with it. And uh, so they fear for our, for our future, lest we blow ourselves up. And, and also for their own, because all the planets Everything is interconnected in the sol solar system through the through the solar wind and everything, and it's going to have an effect on all the other planets. So they they definitely are looking out for our interests and theirs as well. Yes, I can confirm that one hundred percent, Raymond. Um, this is exactly the conversation I had with Kim Jim when my little friends floated me towards the tent to go and meet him. And it was all about emotions and emotional chemistry and preparing ourselves. And he made a lot of neurological cranial developments to my uh, cerebral cortex, but, uh, uh, and he did it in a flash, but we do have to help our own species. We have to help each other with love and kindness and explanation so that everybody can wake up to the same level right around the same time. And this is sort of one of the mystifying things about Ascension is that I can see people who would normally work for a corporation like McDonald's. dollars You can make as much. Okay, here, hold on. I'm just, uh, I'm going to mute the uh, sound on this. Uh, and I wanted to share this other uh, video. While you guys were talking, I just started to bring up, there's another friend of mine uh, I took down to meet in South America. He's a Buddhist and meditates a lot. And I just wanted to, um, uh, uh, share his um, his videos while we talk because we're talking about the uh, um, plasma fields and they're showing up and you'll see multiple ships making displays for him. He has a tremendous amount of information. They appeared to him uh, 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 some time ago. So uh, we'll play this and we can uh, carry on that uh, conversation. Uh -oh. There we go. Go ahead. 
Oh, yeah. yeah, there it is. So, um, let's see. There. Because do you have any anything else you'd like to share in terms of? Um, oh, oh yes. Uh, like um, Commander Reigns has told you, told you, is it's like um, our technology is worrisome be, to the Venusians because it's it's like uh, giving uh, um, car keys to a five year old. Right. So so we can just. Uh, I mean, they're very. Uh, very careful with the technology now. And I think uh, a lot of this had to do with uh, some of the early er, earlier times. Uh, Taz, can you talk about um, some of the um, problems that happened in Atlantis in that time? And what was the kind of the political situation? And maybe David can uh, make some comments on it. All right. Well, sometimes I worry about uh, um, the adulation of Atlantis, of Lemuria, and these lost civilizations precisely because they followed a path that led to their destruction. They had a conflict much like uh, like we have with uh, with Russia or during the, during the Cold War, but uh, it got out of control. And you, you can look for evidence on the earth for that, for these great battles uh, with the sky vehicles like the Vimanas and, and, uh, and actually uh, like the Shiva type of death ray and, and uh, things that these actually happened during that time. There were extraterrestrials that lived among the Atlanteans and Lemurians, and they lived on earth so long that they, they made themselves um, kings and priests and they lost, they lost uh, their identity and, and purpose. They mated, with, uh, they mated with humans and they took sides. And um, we see maybe the same type of thing is happening, is happening again. So um, yeah, I think we have to be very careful when we talk about Atlantis and, and Lemuria because it was no fantasy. Right. Can, can I ask you, and then we'll let David come in here. I, I want to ask you, when you look at the Earth situation, um, and, and David talks about this too, his thoughts are things, and, these negative forces are assaulting our body through their all their mechanizations and control of the governments and their body snatching and, the, and you know all of the cloning and they're not really humans anymore. It's transhumanist agenda with this behind the scenes uh, interference of the interloper to create technologies of food and air and all this to keep the body down in frequency. Uh, what is the orientation for the spirit and for us to not focus on this material beastly world, but to raise our frequency? Because then it's like we're moving so fast that there's nothing that they can do to us that can affect us because we've achieved a new level of gnosis. It's like a train going by really fast and, and they're a cockroach or lower than that. There's no way they can get on a train and mess with humanity. If they try to get near us, we'll just squish them. So uh, right now, it's all smoke and mirrors keeping humanity in ignorance. Well, we have to, the first thing we have to exercise is what Dr. Frank Strange called spiritual discernment. And we have to slow, slow ourselves down. We have to take a break from this world and kind of step aside for a little bit and uh, find find that inner spark, that spark of divinity that, um, that, that's within us and connect to our higher self because that higher self is existing on the higher dimensional levels. Once we can connect with that, we can change the world one, one spirit at a time. How do, how do you see that taking place in this crazy world of media film uh, ignorance? Well, we have to realize that, that the media is corporate sponsored, so their, their message reflects the corporate uh, agenda. But I think what, like what David did um, to come to an epiphany uh, in order to, to, to read things, we have to look to the past, to the wisdom of Confucius and others who come, be, come before us. And uh, if we do that, we can um, establish our, our own intellectual and spiritual identity and, and we could progress from there by 
uh, developing relationships and affinities with other people who think the same way. David, what do you think about that, uh, um, the, the concept there? And how do you think we can change to make our frequency and our attention not focus? I mean, I always say, look at the bad stuff, realize it, but step back and agree to have nothing to do, to do with it. You said you've learned uh, thoughts or things, and why don't you share some of the wisdom of Kim Jim and, and how you think that we could uh, uh, progress a little bit? Well, I think Raymond's explanation is very elegant. So I won't be building on his explanation because he, I, essentially he's correct. Rather than discuss what Kim Jim taught me, I'd like to go to the teachings of Buddha because the great Buddha also said thoughts are things. And, you know, the idea and concept of thoughts being a reality is a very ancient one. Confucius also said the same thing. So did Aristotle. And then, uh, uh, throughout history, we are given lessons about manifestation. The thing that we need to do is what Raymond said is to take a break, is give our minds a break, because in order to receive information continually, and in order to have continual calm and intellectual dialogue with higher species and ourselves, we must start thinking about our minds on a different level. Our mind is our friend and we don't think about our brain because it doesn't create any problems for us. It doesn't move, it doesn't pulsate, uh, it doesn't have brain attacks where you know you grip, grip your head because you need to go to the brain doctor. So we tend to ignore our brain. And this is why in that chapter that I just emailed to you last night, why I rather like people that talk to themselves. I think that's lovely. And if you watch, uh, somebody from a distance or somebody you know who talks to themselves, they're usually happily chatting away with their own mind and they're having a conversation with themselves and that's extremely healthy. And of course, modern science, uh, uh, psychology and psychiatrists will tell you that somebody's unhinged if they're talking to themselves, but that's not the case. Speaking to your mind and loving your mind and understanding your brain and its functions is something that you can do through your chakras. So if everybody could just take 10 minutes a day, that's all. So envision the lights that come from your seven chakras and send a beam up to the seventh chakra at the top of your crown where you communicate with heaven. But tell that beam to stop right on the inside of your skull and have a look around inside your brain and see what answers you get. Because your psyche is connected to not only your past lives, but the more important genetic memory. And when we talk about things repeating themselves, mankind's behavior repeating that of the Atlanteans where we eventually blew ourselves up because our emotions ran away with the bomb instead of our common sense. And so if we change the dialogue with our minds and become comfortable with who we actually are, I think that we'll remove that fear aspect of not going in the right direction through our spiritual and physical evolution. Thank you, David, for those remarks. Uh, we definitely have had many great avatars come among us. And in Western civilization, of course, Socrates said that the greatest thing that we can do is to know, know ourselves. And at the uh, temple at Delphi uh, in, in Greece, in ancient Greece, before you would walk in there under the, the portico, it's a uh, there was a big sign o o overhead that said, know thyself. And uh, th this is the important thing because once we know our, our, ourself, then we're open to communicate with the, with the higher uh, intelligences. So right. our, and, and, our civilization has that blessing that Atlantis right. and Lemuria and everything didn't, didn't have. So we, have, we actually have a chance. We have a chance to make. We have a really great chance. And, and evolution has given us this. When we went from that very strange period that I also mentioned, when we went from agrarian sort of hunter-gatherer to accomplished, you know, agricultural workers and city builders, that, that happened overnight. And it's a genetic leap. And our brain has been giving the, these wonderful genetic triggers which fire off. And ascension is part of the next conclusion of the next genetic trigger that's about to go off because believe me when it hits 
it's not going to be just people that see UFOs. It's going to be every human soul on the planet is going to wake up and go, we love Gaia. What can we do to help? All at the same time, all walks of life, everybody will awaken. Yeah, I think that's a, a positive thing. You know, we're talking about the avatars that are dispatched here. And of course, uh, Remy Keller, I think you'll find this interesting. One of the things, um, you know, I, I don't re recall him telling me um, uh, when the Venusians gave him the technology to, from his living room, establish a bilocation signal. Um, interesting that he was given a, a pair of world one goggles mm. and uh, he was given uh, inside was a little stone that was attuned to him that rested on the bridge of his nose and above oh it was a little antenna and this antenna uh, has been called the the uh there these two stones together are called the urim and the thummim and this one is a seer and the one that's attuned to him was the knower and then the other aspect is, is he was given a breastplate like uh, Aaron was in the Ark of the Covenant. And right. in those days, they would create tents around. They kind of create a Holy of Holies where everyone stayed out and the Ark was there. And Aaron, Moses's half brother, would um, stand in front of the Ark and a priest behind him would answer questions. And we're not sure exactly if he saw letters or what he saw, but the answers were given. In, in uh, Dr. Keller's instance, he was able to look. He chose the Nag Hammadi uh, library scripture because uh, he felt that uh, Jesus's twin brother would probably have a very interesting um, uh, tale. And so in the Gospel of Thomas, which is going to be printed soon, he, Wonderful. he did what is called the, the uh, Acts of Thomas, which is Thomas with the disciples of Jesus, uh, I think 100 Acts. And then he did what is called the Youth Gospel of Jesus, which is the recounting of Thomas of Jesus' life um, as a child, raising people from the dead, like from the age of seven or eight. And then, of course, the Gospel of Thomas, and then the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And Wonderful. So so, Kaz, why don't you share a little bit um, about that experience in the bilocation signal and what what you gathered from from uh, these this wonderful experience of being able to write a very up to date gospel? Well, I wanted to I wanted to uh, do this for a long time um, when I was uh, attending the seminary at the. Uh, in Independence, Missouri, for the Community of Christ. We have a temple there and a library, and uh, they let me see the seer stones that uh, the Prophet Joseph Smith uh, used. And uh, they had those stones? Yeah, I actually I actually handled them. And those I, was saw, it? I saw the, 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 his own handwriting where he translated the Reformed Egyptian using the seer stone. So I, I, I thought that would be so cool to do something like that. I always wanted to do it. And after having contact with the Venusians, it made it, it, made it possible to, to do that. So I looked at the Nag Hammadi texts and I saw that, and I, I looked at them and to see which ones I thought were the most important. And I thought since Thomas is the, the twin brother of Jesus, uh, that would be very important to get the fullness of his testimony when he was growing up with Jesus. So we have the infancy gospel. Then in the gospel of Thomas, it's a, a very philosophical treatise. And in section 99, it ends where um, Thomas reproves the other apostles, particularly Peter, uh, for discounting Mary Magdalene and, and saying that Jesus didn't tell you these things, um, we don't we we don't believe you. You're just a you're just a woman, but actually he recognized her as being the thirteenth apostle. So I said, well, we have to have the Gospel of Mary Magdalene in there too. So that's the text, and the, the end of the text, and then the and then the that's the fourth text, and then the the third text is the Acts of Thomas when he traveled throughout India. So it's a it's a, it's an awesome book. 
I was able to use that device to fill in all the missing spaces in the, the Nag Hammadi uh, text and to make any corrections in it. So it now reads really s smoothly and uh, it's it's all footnoted all throughout, matching to the Holy Bible and also the teachings that I received from um, uh, Tatiana Urban, wow. Dr. Urban uh, from Annalise Scarin and Tatiana was related to Annalise Scarin, the, wow. the, the Mormon prophetess. And then, uh, and uh, then the Clayton, Clayton Parker, who is my mentor. Wow, that sounds wonderful. You know, oftentimes getting the the symmetry and the timeline to be sympathetic to the souls that you'd like to talk about is so so difficult. And if you manage to do that, it'll make it a lot easier to learn about these ancient lessons. You know, I think about Mary Magdalene as the thirteenth apostle and how desperate the Romans were to pull the goddess from the temple and to make her into uh, uh, the image of, of a whore, basically, when uh, she was actually uh, so much more. She was, at the time, the Mother Earth goddess for all children born. Yes, and, yes. And yes. Very, good. A very important character in, in, in the, the, the understanding of a higher love and understanding of motherly love. Because, you know, motherly love, I think, is probably as close to Christ's love as any type of love that we can understand as a species. Because nobody loves you more than our mother. Our mother Earth loves us the same way, Raymond. You know, she will give us everything until there is only stone. And then whatever happens. So I think ascension is going to have to be mandatory. <laughs> and... Uh, and that uh, in order to reverse and stop the, the things that are occurring on the planet right now, we just have to support each other and all humans. And remember that to guide your day in the right direction, uh, obviously we want to recognize the love of Christ and the, the angelic guides that come with Christ. But we must change the hearts of men as an activity that we work on every day here in this reality so that we can help everybody wake up at the same time. Because yeah. everything's possible with the guidance of love and forgiveness. Amen, Brother David. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm not. Uh, I'm no stranger to the love of Christ, and and I just, I would just love it to read what you have to say about Mary Magdalene because she's one of my personal heroes. I'll send you a. I'll send you a copy of it. Um, Kathy Keats, the publisher of Headline Books, said that the, uh, that uh, the. Uh, copy there's an e-copy on amazon or there were or there will be very soon and she was hoping that we could get it out before published in a book form before the uh, mount Shasta conference it's well you know i tell you what i'd rather get a buy it and have the paper copy because um i'm limiting the amount of time i spend looking at a screen because i have to do i my my schoolwork, it took five years to get my MSc and, and my eyes became very, very tired. I, every once in a while I have to sleep with, you know, grated cucumbers in a towel on them because it's just almost like I've got welder's flash. And um, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, writing right now and trying to stay off of computers and reading things off of computers. And of course, 5G uh, is, is, has a frequential uh, vibration at such a high rate that it's very damaging to our optic nerve. So I'm trying to stay off my cell phone as much as possible as well. I recommend that for everybody, by the way. Oh, I, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, um, you know, in the days of old manual typewriters and carbon paper and everything. Wonderful. They, they came up with computers supposedly to save time, but now they waste more time than, than anything at, at all, it was much quicker to just to, right. and plus you didn't have to worry about being hacked or spied right. upon or and there was no stress. The only stress was getting the manuscript to the post office. Right, right. I'm gonna share with you a little technology <laughs> from the Venusians. I'm kind of proud I finally got this together. I've been doing a lot of writing too, and uh wonderful. My my eyesight went down with the advent of cell phones, but um, totally I'm gonna share with you um um the device I'm wearing around my neck. This is uh, Fred Bell, uh, who who uh, was given this on Christmas Day by the Plea uh, by the Pleiadians. I went up on Christmas Day in 1975, 
And he told me I just up in Semyasi ship last night about two in the morning. Um, he would go over the hill there in Laguna near Arch Beach Heights and he would get on board and she took him up and gave him the design to this, these devices. We have like the one I'm wearing, four leg wave. There's a bunch of different designs. Um, the price are pretty pricey. I, I kind of price it out the average price of a diamond if you wanted one, natural diamonds. But I want to- uh, They're so to, beautiful. Yeah, they're really, they have, I do demonstrations on them. I'm going to put this up here too, but I, I just wanted to share, there's a, a tremendous amount of information here into the science of um, electrical precursation, which is really uh, the science of um, of how the soul comes into the body. You wonder if the chicken came before the egg. Well, the people from Coldass said that they created the chicken on earth uh, for humans after the flood to eat so that the egg came first. But when we look at our body, we are uh, a soul inhabiting a body and that soul expresses itself through electromagnetic imposition on the physical plane where we create it. So if you look down here, I've got some of these incredible manuals. This is all about it. You click on this link and then uh, uh, I've actually uh, recreated the original paradigm manual from 1982. Um, uh, this is of course the, the birthday cake shit picture taken by Billy Meyer, the Pleiadians, but We've, I've uh, kind of uh, I've added a little bit, but this takes goes through all the pyramid energy and all the technology uh, and understanding stuff. So when you get down to the, the jewelry stuff, it's really fun. So I have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, information uh, on this thing. You come down here and we even have, uh, you know, I'm working with his daughter. So I have complete and total right and usage to every aspect of every one of his books, everything he's ever done. And of course, um, we go through the various technologies here, my dedication to Fred and all this stuff. So there's a lot of fun stuff. I, I had to kind of, I'm kind of doing a little bit of commercial here because I'm kind of excited to release this product. Totally cool, man. Totally cool. I mean, I, I, I sent uh, Raymond, I sent um, Rob an email a few weeks back and I said, you know, it's really getting hard to make money the normal way when you're spending more and more time in uh, writing healthy. physics manuals for the physics for the physics people right. that, that don't have a clue. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to spend time with our friends that come from other galaxies and planets, and you know, admittedly, eighty percent of that time is through celestial communication and through ESP communication and when we're meditating and we get that message, it's getting harder and harder for us to make money. And, you know, I'm looking at some of the other sites from people and they have the most wonderful things and devices that they've created to help us cognate what's going on. And I see the pathway, by the way, Rob, I can see the pathway in that, that, in that circle on that. And, and it was funny that we were just talking about Aaron's breastplate because, you know, Aaron's breastplate apparently had gemstones in it. And yeah, they, Raymond and I was talking about it. He didn't want to reveal exactly. Oh, this, that's so pretty. And you know, my birthstone's aqua marine, so I'm probably going to get yeah. one of those from you and have a nice fat aqua in it. That's called a castigan wave trap on the back. And right. It looks like a yin yang symbol. What it does is it filters that that parabolic curve is at 22.3 megahertz, one of the major replication frequencies of the DNA. No, it's wonderful. And, and you know, when um, when we go up to Nathan's cabin up at 7,000 feet up in the mountains to ask our friends to come down and land, and I'm going to have to have Nathan talk to you about the experience. He had a sphere come down and they showed him some technology and it's fabulous. Hey, just, did you meet him physically? It, yeah, it, it just happened. Um, this last week? No, no, no. A couple months ago, about five or six months ago. But he came down and they stepped out? Yeah, and he's been he's been digesting it. He hasn't been able to call anybody or reach out because yeah, I can imagine it's that contact that happens, and it's, it was a really good thing for Nathan because he's starting to understand the the goddess message as well. Mm -hmm. Because you know Nathan's a very manly man, yeah. and um, he it runs against his paradigm of being a being a macho guy, right. and then all of a sudden you know he's he's flooded with these. Uh, feminine intuitions 
And was he by himself or did they arrange it? Because when he goes up. No, there, there was others. There were others. And there them? was somebody else with him. Oh, it's fascinating. And I'm, I'm going to get Nathan to open up about it. I've asked him to send a text or call Laura Eisenhower because, you know, Laura well, has. People don't want to come out uh, to the public. Well, no, I don't think he's going to talk about it visually because he's not that kind of guy. I just wanted him to reconnect with Laura because she has very good feminine uh, energy and very, very good intuition. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that she'll be able to help him transcend the emotions of being a modern male after having that lesson right because it's really difficult you know some of these guys are thinking with their with their unit instead of their heart and that's one of the that's one of the problems about being a male is that we don't necessarily always feel the way that we're supposed to and it's also i think a testament to other human beings that understand that we still have to be human beings. We still have to be earth men. I'm sorry, guys. We're not going to just call somebody up with our minds and take a trip to Aldebaran. It's, it's going to happen to all of us. But right now, we still have to hold down our jobs, pay for the gasoline, you know, pay the bills and pay the rent. So I really love what everyone's doing. And uh, I, I think that if we can all create books and if we can all create uh, jewelry that has meaning or... Um, uh, just like a, a Paula Asteria's staffs or power staffs. She's amazing too, but we all have to produce something and sell it. And I, I urge people in the community to please purchase from people that you care about, because as we get more and more involved with the communication with extraterrestrials and species who have been caring for us for thousands of years, there is a, there is a distinct disconnect. And yeah, it's, we, it's we need to come together and, and, uh, you know, initiate prosperity and abundance. Raymond, Raymond and I, um, we're uh, creating a nonprofit and we're gonna be trying to create a center here, kind of a, uh, a divine, uh, an art gallery and a shrine right. and a repository for uh, advanced information and a meeting place for people to heal on, here on Mount Chassa. And there's a lot of those all well, created by a lot of different I people here. So. Some- if you'll allow me, then I'll, I'll make some material wealth donations to that so that you yeah. can sell, sell them. We're, got, we're working on the nonprofit now. But okay. uh, thank you guys both very much. Uh, would you, uh, do you have any final parting thoughts, Dave? Um, no, just what a lovely treat. I'm, I was going to go build a, a desk for my son. Uh, William's got his own apartment now down on the beach. He's a very lucky young man. Okay. And uh, I was going to go build a desk from him. Then you called and said, hey, let's do an impromptu. So I love you guys so much. And it was so nice to be thought of. And God bless you both. All right, thank, thank you so much, thank Josh. You, thank Any you, parting wor- words from the Venetians? Oh, oh yes. Um, by all means, uh, explore your creative side. Get out there, create music, create, create art. All of this elevates consciousness and makes its world a better place to live. Yeah, thank you for you. All right, thanks, folks, for watching the Victory of Light radio show with uh, David Wallace and Raymond Keller, uh, contactees from uh, Aldebaran in the Taurus system, and Raymond Keller from our sister planet, Venus. Thank you very much, and uh, be sure to see you at the Mount Shasta <laughs> Summer Conference and you can contact Dave if you want some tickets. Thank you so much. And God bless. Or um, if he's sold out by that time, you can always uh, just get him on my website. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. I guys. see you, Dave. Thanks. Bye, guys. God bless. Okay.